Well, we're here today with Dr. Nevin. Dr. Nevin, thank you very much for giving us your time today. And we're just going to ask you a couple of questions um, for posterity, uh, for the <laughs> students of behavior analysis. Um, so can we start out with um, what events in your history maybe led you into the field of behavior analysis? Sure. Um, by the way, I'm known, my, my formal name is John Anthony Nevin. I am known universally as Tony. <laughs> but people get confused sometimes when this John Nevin appears in uh, the title of you know, author of an article. <clears throat> well, I'd never even heard of behavior analysis when I went to university. In fact, I'd not, I heard of psychology, but I was an engineer. I studied mechanical engineering in the early 1950s. And over the course of the next few years, I was in the Coast Guard. I spent a lot of time at sea, so I did a lot of reading. And I encountered um, 19th century psychophysics. It, wow, is that ever great? You're going to examine the relationship between private experience, private experience for following sensory input, and mathematically relate the private experience to the physical Stimulus? Wow! So, yeah, bridging the physical world and the private psychological world. I thought, gee, I think when I get out of the Coast Guard, I'll go do that. <laughs> and so I went to Columbia University in order to do visual psychophysics with uh, Professor Graham. Now, mind, I've never had any psychology at all. So, <laughs> this is great. You just walk in and start doing research. But another event that uh, shifted my path within the field fairly quickly was that I was getting lousy data on the color vision project that I was working on, and I figured out eventually why. It was just, it's, I'm not going to get technical about it, but at the same time, um, second year graduate school, I got married, my wife got pregnant, I needed money. <laughs> Um, the only paying research assistantship at that time was in the rat and pigeon laboratories of uh, Dr. Keller, Fred Keller. And also with him were uh, Professor Bill Cumming and a research associate named Bob Berryman. So uh, Bob hired me to build apparatus. Somehow they thought an engineering background would be useful. <laughs> And I did. And then he said, let's do an experiment together. So we did. And in 1962, we did, uh, we published an experiment on interlocking schedules of reinforcement in the rat. It was great because the data were orderly, unlike my color vision stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and it was fun. And Bob and I were working side by side. And we literally wrote the article together, sometimes word by word. So it's just total immersion and a wonderful process. I couldn't have had a better mentorship or internship introduction. And so there it is. You get paid for it and it's fun. You do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's what I've done ever since. But the psychophysical aspect of my interests has remained alive studies of signal detection and some work on auditory psychophysics with Professor McGill have inspired me to keep that kind of quantitative approach in my work. So I've tried to bring a sort of psychophysical orientation to behavioral data and, and procedures. Sometime later, after I heard of behavior analysis. This was called experimental psychology back in those days. It was not behavior analysis. We were general experimental psychologists. Well, behavior analysis sort of came on the scene in the 1970s as a name for an enterprise. And so I found myself getting more and more involved in that and less and less in general experimental psychology, uh, perceptual phenomena, signal detection and the like. So, <laughs> it's like concurrent operants. 
if the schedule is more favorable <laughs> for behavior of class A, and particularly if it's a ratio schedule, so the more you do, the more you get. Well, that's the way it's been for me in uh, doing behavior analytic research and uh, behavioral theory. And my theoretical work, largely quantitative, has been informed by the sort of psychophysical background that I bring to it. Excellent. So that's my story. So that, that schedule, um, that ratio schedule had to do with the nature of the work as opposed to, or was it more the, the social environment of what would be published? Oh, I would say it was the work. It was the work? It was the fun of the work, getting the data, also building the apparatus. I used to love to build the apparatus myself. And I, back in the days before computer control, there was nothing in the laboratories that I had that I couldn't repair with my Swiss Army knife. <laughs> <laughs> and that was great. Of course, now it's... Uh, I wish that were still the case. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> I do, too. Um, no, the, the thrill for me has been designing experiments, seeing the data coming out, um, whether the data conform to expectation is somewhat beside the point. If they're orderly, mm -hmm. yeah. it, it's, it's the joy of capturing quantitative order and seeing it in a framework of other quantitative relations so that um, the world starts to make sense, even if it didn't coincide with what you expected when you started the experiments. Well, you've already answered a little bit of my next question, mm -hmm. how you were you trained as a behavior analyst, but if you could talk a little bit about your mentors specifically and, and what they Sure. What um, well, Bob Berryman was the research associate with whom I, I enjoyed both a, a relationship as friend and the mentoring, which, as I said, ranged from building apparatus and hanging out in the lab and uh, drinking beer together. and he, he didn't have any teaching duties. Um, how to prepare graphs for publication all by hand. How to write a clear sentence and, and put it into a well-structured article. He, he was great. Uh, Bill Cumming, who was also on the project, um, taught me a lot of general psychology, none of which I knew. Um, and that was very helpful. <laughs> and Fred Keller just inspired me with his teaching. His style of teaching was great. He did a, a one semester course, a rat lab course, for graduate students who had never had any previous experience with uh, operant conditioning. And we did the Psych 1 routine of shaping lever pressing and establishing schedule performance and discriminative control and chaining and so on. So that was great. Um, and, uh, well, oh, another very important thing was that Keller and Berryman and Cumming had a project on the complex discriminated operant, which was basically matching the sample. Is that familiar to you? Somewhat. Yeah. Um, and they were, they basically had some grant that allowed them to uh, take pigeons, train them to do matching to sample in various forms, and then shoot them up with various drugs and see what would happen. Absolutely no idea why any particular drug should have affected any particular aspect of performance. So we tried LSD and we tried clostromazine and everything. It sort of threw the pharmacopoeia at them. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think we learned much about drugs, but I sure learned a lot about matching the sample. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that I, all right, this is not on this question, but much later in my professional life, uh, working with Tim Shan and Amy Odom and Michael Davison, I was able to bring matching the sample back into my repertoire of operant performances that I could treat in exactly the same way as free operant response rate in a mathematical model. So that was great. So it took 50 years to get there, but I got there. No, 40 years. Okay, because it was a short time. What was it like to be a behavior analyst in your early years in the field? 
um, I would say, somewhat isolating. Uh, at Swarthmore College, uh, that was uh, home of old style Gestalt psychology. The people there had been in Germany and had mostly fled Germany in the 1930s. And, uh, well, they had their world view. It was very different. <laughs> so we started having, every week we would have lunch together and I would explain something about I was, I was doing on odd numbered weeks and they'd explain something about Gestalt and perception from their perspective on even numbered weeks. So it was quite a learning experience for them as well as for me, but I certainly never had anything like a supportive colleagueship at the college. That open dialogue sounds very cordial, though. So oh, it was very cordial. Very <laughs> I even ran Solomon Ash in a room-sized version of a pigeon chamber, <laughs> and I laid on him a task which I now refer to as multiple uh, matching the sample. Mm -hmm where if, say, a yellow overhead light is on, then you're supposed to hit a red key and then choose the red rather than the <laughs> green. But if a blue overhead light is on and you hit a red key, you're supposed to pick the green rather than the red. So you get stimulus control over a complex matching performance, mm -hmm. alternating with stimulus control over another complex performance, choose the odd one. Uh -huh. And <laughs> Tell me, pigeons do this? <laughs> and I said, yes, and demonstrated a pigeon doing it. <laughs> Which was, by the way, my favorite demonstration. I'm telling stories. That's fine. Um, I was teaching undergraduate psychology. So I would demonstrate the pigeon thing. And I started it out with two pigeons. One of them had learned matching to sample rather than oddity, and the other one had learned oddity rather than matching. Okay. And there were two separate chambers, and I said, these are two separate performances. So I took one of them and showed that I could switch it back and forth between matching and oddity. And some students said, why don't you put those two pigeons in the chamber at the same time? What? Yeah, so I did. And the one who thought it was time to do matching, which I shouldered the other one <laughs> out of the way and get it to key with the odd color and vice versa. So they were battling back and forth and the, the lecture hall just collapsed in howls. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's comedy to be had in all of this as well as uh, enlightenment. Just another good example of why they're good models for humans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, well, what do you consider your most important contributions to behavior analysis? What, you, what would you like to be remembered for? Um, Almost, yeah, it's the development of behavioral momentum theory. Does this mean anything to you? Absolutely. That's good. If that started, it probably would never have come to pass if I hadn't been trained as an engineer. And um, so I was you know, accustomed to thinking in physical terms, classical physics. And so the, uh, the metaphorical map between behavior change and the change in the rate of a moving object mm -hmm was too good to resist, and so I called it behavioral momentum. It's been a catchy metaphor, and uh, it's rather caught on. It has. And there's been some applied work in there, and there's all kinds of um, outcomes. Is it, what, what sort of outcomes would you like to see from that work? That I would... <laughs> I'm so excited to see that it is the ideas are going into treatment settings now. I've been to maybe eight papers, and they've and about treatment applications of momentum. Mm -hmm. And the ideas in the model are turning out to be pretty good predictors of what reinforcers are going to do with uh, problem behavior in a variety of settings. One of the things that the model explicitly predicts, by the way, this is a result of collaborations with Tim Sheehan and other people at Utah State University, is that when you suspend a treatment based on differential reinforcement of alternative behavior, good old DRA, there is relapse, problem behavior recurs, but the extent to which it recurs depends on its prior history of reinforcement in accordance with the behavioral momentum model. It's as if 
all this momentum that was built up on this behavior. You do the DRA, and that sort of interrupts it, mm -hmm. suppresses it. As soon as you remove it, bingo, the old behavior is back. But the extent to which it comes back depends on how frequently or how generously it was reinforced before treatment. When you're dealing with a troubled behavior, a kid with troubling behavior, you don't know what the history of reinforcement is before you do your intervention. Sure. So it's important to explore in the basic lab how various histories are going to interact with various kinds of reinforcer-based treatments, and that's, that's part of what we're doing now. It's also very important to try to find ways of alleviating relapse. Uh, these are, you know, when somebody resumes the problem behavior, that's, that's relapse. Mm -hmm. Very common, all sorts of problematic behavior exhibit relapse under a lot of circumstances. So I'm, we have a, a research grant now. I'm working with five colleagues um, on everything from pigeon modeling of the procedures to uh, well, application with kids with really severe problem behavior to try to see if we can circumvent the relapse-producing effects of suspending treatment. And how about that? I think we can do it. We've got okay, some, exactly. we've so got, you know, but one kid and eight pigeons. <laughs> 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 but I'm encouraged. I don't need much. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't make them compete for the key. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good for you. All right, so how do you think behavior analysis is, has changed over the years that you've been in the field? Um, it's become more systematic, uh, the research part. I'm going to talk only about experimental analysis. Okay. Has become, you know, only recently have I gotten caught up in the applied part, very recently. Uh, experimental work has become much more systematic in the sense of systematic exploration of variables. We're, we've passed the sort of fun part of demonstrating that reinforcers would work. That yes, you can teach a dog to bark. And all these wonderful things that were coming out in the 50s and 60s, that was great good fun. Um, and now it's more parametric exploration of variables, systematic, much more use of quantitative uh, equations to describe the results, much more use of quantitative formulations as frameworks within which those quantitative descriptions can be nested and they will be seen to be coherent. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. It's, it's a mature, truly a mature natural science in that respect. Does that mean we have all the answers? Of course not. Does any mature natural science? No. Excellent. <laughs> so is, is there anything in the, your career that you would have done differently? Yeah, in teaching. I, my final um, position was at the University of New Hampshire. Now, I'd been at Columbia, I'd been at Swarthmore College. At Swarthmore, every kid in the room was brighter than me. Um, at Columbia, well, most of them. <laughs> at UNH, you know, it's a land-grant university, and it's committed to educating kids who are just barely making it mm -hmm. as much as the high performers. And I... I was teaching statistics. That was part of the department joke, make him use statistics, even though he never uses it in his research. <laughs> um, to teach statistics. And I remember one time that uh, a young woman in my class, we were talking about nonparametrics and ranges and quartiles. And, so, and I put a bunch of numbers on the board and said, now, could you divide this into quartiles? And she said, now that means you want me to divide eight numbers into four parts. Is that right? Can you give me a minute and a piece of paper? And I said, good God, what are you doing here? That was a terrible thing to do. Terrible. I demeaned her, and I apologized, of course, but that was an instinctive response. Of, I apologize to the universe for having done that. And it wasn't the only time that I was short 
dismissive with underperforming students. I would not do that again. And I hope that none of the rest of you ever do that. Everybody deserves encouragement, shaping, and if they don't have the repertoire, it's not their fault. Yeah. <laughs> the organism is uh, yeah. always right. Right. Okay, so what, uh, what areas of the field would you like to see more work in besides uh, momentum? Well, um, or momentum, if you'd like to elaborate more. I would like to see more effort at applying principles of behavior analysis to social problems and to do it really carefully, systematically, um, and that's hard to do. I'm thinking primarily of uh, any behavior that can mitigate the effects of climate change. Very hard to do, but we pretty much know what's behind the difficulty behaviorally. It's delayed discounting, right? Take the small immediate rather than the deferred, uncertain, indefinitely deferred, maybe consequence. And then there's a momentum component because if you take this relatively immediate reinforcer, you drive your car, you make money on the stock market, buying oil stocks, whatever, um, that behavior is going to persist. So the, the combination of delay discounting and momentum, I think, is calamitous. <laughs> How are we going to break that up in real applications? I don't know. But that's what I'm thinking about now, and I would love to see a concerted effort by all behavior scientists towards attuning the way the environment is structured, the way educational offerings are done, to bring that problem um, to the fore. And I hope um, do something to change it. <laughs> Well, that leads into um, a another question. As a person who has a lot of experience and um, expertise in quantification, uh, do you feel like um, some of the quantitative work that has been done um, is quantitative work that is easily applicable in an engineering standpoint, because you're an engineer, um, and many engineers can sort of take the quantification from physics and yeah. quantification tools there and adapt them to chaotic environments, to chaotic systems yes. and things. Do you yes. think that behavior analysis is there, or do you think that there is? I think that there are a few people who can do that kind of stuff who aren't primarily interested in behavior analysis, but mm -hmm. they are interested in complex systems okay. and indeterminate systems, perhaps, mm -hmm. as in uh, chaotic systems. And there we need collaboration. It's not that the behavior analyst should go master all the skills of uh, computational um, thermodynamics. That's what my daughter does, computational thermodynamics. <laughs> um, I can understand, sort of. But no way could I really do it. But if I could pose a problem to her, and she could see a way to bring it into a computational framework, then maybe we could do some good together. Okay. So you think that those, those, that those methods of quantification could enter into that? Absolutely. Cool. And, you know, the Society for Quantitative Analysis of Behavior, mm -hmm. uh, getting more and more into uh, computer simulation of complex systems, including neural network modeling. Mm -hmm. um, it, when we first formed the society, it was basically about quantitative interpretations of overt action and matching law choice and so on, the standard stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's not true anymore. It's become a much more rich and subtle theoretical um, endeavor. And I think that's great. Wonderful. All right, so uh, what do you think is the future of behavior analysis as a field? Collaborative. Um, really. What I just said, for example, for the basic research, collaborating with smart folks who can do uh, computational work really well um, to understand complex systems, collaboration with neuroscience 
I just came from a talk with, uh, given by Bernard Balain, which poses interesting questions for my research on behavioral momentum. Now, I didn't know Dr. Balain, but I knew I was aware of the work, but having him summarize it all, I need to spend a couple of hours with this guy. <laughs> and probably he needs to spend a couple of hours with me. And I will somehow initiate the conversation and see where we can go with it. Wonderful. I'll have to get back and interview you again after that. <laughs> well, so you, you touched on students um, and the importance of students. What would you like to tell the students about the future? What would you like to? What message would you like to send to them? Um, I would like to say the skills that you are learning in behavior analysis can make a huge difference in application. You really can make people's lives better with the techniques, but in order to do it really well and to go beyond um, relatively programmed, cookbooky kinds of approaches to uh, reinforcer-based therapies, you've got to know the basic science. And so I would urge today's students to learn well, the kind of stuff that I did for 30 or 40 years and that many other fine behavior analysts are doing so that they can think in more abstract quantitative terms about the relations that they're implementing day to day, face to face with a participant or a client. Mm -hmm. um, and again, collaboration. Um, collaborate with medical people. Um, they know a lot. <laughs> Uh, collaborate with behavioral pharmacolo pharmacologists uh, because a lot of the people that you're going to work with in the clinical settings are on various kinds of drugs. You've got to know what's going on there. And if you don't know, find somebody who does. And that's, that's basically uh, work in a group and include people in that group who are not just like you. <laughs> Which is not easy to do. It's not sage advice. How how would you recommend to a person who is going outside of behavior analysis um, what what parts of behavior analysis should they always remember to keep in mind, and and what parts of behavior analysis should they should they be adapting? Because that's one. Well, I guess the fundamental message is in, in selection by consequences. If, Consequences. That's that's it. <laughs> now, the various ways in which that overarching principle works out in particular situations is, can be very complicated. But that is the overarching principle that should be carried along and at every level. How does the effectiveness of the treatment that you're administering have consequences for the program that you work in and for the education of others. For you, know, you should try to see yourself so that your work is shaped by its consequences and perhaps guided by anticipated future consequences for you and for your field. Good, good answer. Very broad. Yeah, so, very uh, broad, therefore unhelpful. <laughs> Sorry. Sometimes those broad abstractions are the things that can help to, to integrate. That's why I asked, is because you know many people going into other fields have a hard time sometimes synthesizing and bringing with them the, the core pieces of mm -hmm. behavior analysis without necessarily just you know adapting, mm -hmm. becoming a, a different kind, having a different kind of background. So, so I was curious as to your insights into that. Well, so selection by consequences. Selection by consequences. Right back to Skinner. Genesis 1-1, <laughs> to put it in biblical terms. In the beginning was selection by consequences. <laughs>